Hi, I'm Ian Plant, professional photographer, and I'm here today with Lilia Khalif from Outdoor Photography Guide. She's going to be my co-host today. And welcome to the second episode of OPG Live. Uh, those of you who joined us on our first episode, you can see we've spruced things up a little bit. We're trying to make gradual improvements. We still haven't added a uh, component that allows us to show photos, but we're hoping by the next episode we'll be able to do that. So I'm here today to answer your questions about wildlife photography. We've got a bunch of questions that were submitted ahead of time. And if you're watching, you can also submit questions during the live broadcast. And we're going to pick out the best questions. And I'm going to answer as many as I can during the hour that we have. Uh, be, but before we start, I think Lilia has a few housekeeping yeah. items that she'd like to discuss. Yeah, I just want to let you know that you can follow us on all our relevant social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, so you can get updates and make sure you know when we're going live. We'll be posting about it all the time, and so you can get some great content, some photography inspiration, and just general great outdoor photography guide content. Also, if you look below us, there's some text and a little banner below, and you can download the free essential ebook. Go down there and click on it. I'm sure you'll enjoy it if you're watching OPG Live, same kind of content. And uh, there's also a discount code for everyone for my new Falklands wildlife video, instructional video I shot with fellow photographer Zach Mills when we were down in the Falklands. It's about a half an hour of content that shows our artistic processes and the equipment and techniques that we use when we're photographing wildlife. And the, there's a discount code that gives you 40% off, and that is Falkland40. So all of this information is going to be appearing in the... Uh, comment section below the video live cast so you can see it down below. You don't have to remember it or write it down. It'll be available for you. And before we start with the questions, I just wanted to give some general observations about my approach to wildlife photography. A lot of the questions I've uh, received so far have been people asking about how they can zoom in, how they can use longer lenses to get uh, shots of animals that are more portraits, you know, really tight portrait shots. And my advice, my general advice to people is to consider going the opposite way, often zooming out. You don't want to just photograph the animal. I mean, that's certainly an approach you can take. And uh, there's a lot of great wildlife photographs that are indeed tight portraits of animals. But I prefer to zoom out a bit and to go wider and to show the animal in the context of its environment. And this allows you to tell a more complete story about your wildlife subject, but it also allows you to create a more interesting composition because you'll be including extra visual elements within the, the wider composition, and this can make it more visually interesting. So I'm always telling people, don't you know, resist the temptation to zoom in and get that tight shot of the animal. Instead, think about ways that you can zoom out tell more of a story and show the animal in the context of the environment. So when I answer a lot of these questions, I'm going to be going back to this basic design principle that I incorporate into a lot of my wildlife photos. So without further ado, why don't we start with some questions. Lilia? Yep, I got a whole bunch of questions here and I just want to remind everybody to continue to keep submitting questions live. I'll be moderating them and pulling them through. Always keep asking them and interacting with us and we'll try and pull them right through here. So. First question, what's the most difficult situation you've encountered in a wildlife photography situation and how did you overcome it? Well, this is a, a really interesting question. I've actually encountered a lot of difficult situations with wildlife photography. So instead of picking the most difficult one, maybe I'll talk about some, some common issues that I've had. Uh, one, you know, one difficulty I think that most wildlife photographers face is getting close enough to the animal to make a good photograph. Some animals are very skittish. Uh, and uh, they just won't allow you to approach. There are certainly places where you can go where the animals are more habituated to people, they're more used to people, and this will allow you to get closer. So I think, for example, going to, in the United States, national wildlife refuges are usually a good place to get good wildlife photos because in those places, the animals that you might wish to photograph are used to people being around. Another thing that a lot of photographers do uh, in a lot of places with, with photographing wildlife is they stay in their vehicle. So they go to a place where there may be a road that will take you into a wildlife area. And is, if you stay in the vehicle, the animals are a little less skittish then. Uh, though I've certainly encountered animals that are as skittish about vehicles as they are about people. But uh, these are approaches that can allow you to get closer to animals. And it's certainly easiest if you go to places where, where the animals are used to being around people. If you're in areas where the animals aren't, as used to being around people. Other options include uh, getting really creative with uh, camouflaging yourself or using a hide or a blind and waiting for the animals to come to you. And these are all options that, uh, that definitely you can, um, 
you can use. Uh, another problem, this is kind of the flip side of not getting close enough, is getting too close to the animals. Uh, there's a lot of people who speak about wildlife photography ethics and recommend that you don't get too close to an animal. And of course, that's something that I try to do myself. I don't like getting so close that I'm disturbing an animal uh, or scaring it away. But no one ever tells you what happens when the animal starts coming towards you. A lot of animals, if, you, if you're being, especially if you're being really good at, uh, at uh, camouflaging yourself or uh, keeping your profile low and non-threatening, the animal might notice you but might not be concerned about you and may head towards you. So uh, especially when you're working with larger animals, I remember once when I was in uh, Yellowstone National Park and I was photographing bison, I was outside of my vehicle and I had some large bulls that were walking towards me. And I had an escape plan, so I knew that when the animals got closer to me that I would uh, start backing away and then I would go behind my vehicle so that I could be in a safe place as they pass me by. Uh, so always have a good escape plan when you're photographing animals and you're afraid that they might come towards you and get too close and maybe put yourself or the animal in harm's way. Now with that Yellowstone story, unfortunately, I had an escape plan, but I didn't have a plan B. I uh, turned around when the animals were too close to go hide behind my vehicle, which was about 20 feet away, only to realize that another group of bison had come up the road and I didn't realize it, and they were standing exactly where I wanted to be behind my vehicle. So um, I had to get creative to avoid being trampled by the bison <laughs> that were now walking right by me. Uh, so always be careful. You don't want to disturb or harm the animal, and you don't want to get yourself hurt by the animal. So you want to be careful when you're trying to get close to get that perfect shot, which is another reason why I'm often taking a wider view is that allows me to keep a safe distance between me and my animal subject, which means I can do more photography because I'm not risking frightening the animal away. And it also allows me to take that broader view, showing the animal in the context of its environment and creating a more interesting composition. Hmm, interesting. All right, we got a more specific question here. Do you have any tips on how to track an eagle at close range with a 200 to 500 millimeter lens? Well, tracking, uh, I'm assuming that this is, this is a question about tracking a bird in flight in particular. When you're moving, when you're working with fast-moving animals, especially birds, uh, keeping the lens on them can be difficult. Now, if you're, if you're working with a zoom lens, like a 200 to 500 millimeter lens, one technique that can be effective uh, and is a technique that I've used before is you zoom out a bit while you're moving with the animal. Because often the hardest thing to do, especially when you have a long telephoto lens, is to keep the animal within the image frame. With a long telephoto lens, any movement you make is greatly magnified. So if you uh, slip your arm a little bit to one side or the other, you can completely lose the animal from the image frame, and it's harder to keep track of it. So a lot of times, wildlife photographers, if they're working with a zoom lens, will zoom out while they're tracking the subject. And then once they've got the, the rate of movement uh, kind of dialed in so you figured out where the animal's flying and you're moving steadily with it uh, if you're capable of doing so and it often can be difficult when you're in the in the uh, in the moment but if you then zoom in so that you get the framing that you want um, then you can get the the shot that you're looking for so it's a bit easier to track when you've zoomed out a bit so you zoom in at the last moment when you're ready to take the shot so that's one technique another thing you want to be able to make sure that you do is that you use your camera's predictive autofocus mode. So uh, all cameras have different modes, and there's usually a mode on each camera. The, they all have different names. Like for Canon, which is what I use, they call it AI Servo. It's a predictive autofocus mode that tracks moving subjects. So that's something that you really want to have, because if you try to use like a one-shot mode or something like that where you have a focus point or a group of focus points that's trying to track the animal, and you have to keep the animal you have to keep the focus points on that uh, animal as it's moving. If, it, if the animal moves out of that focus point range, you're going to lose focus. But with a predictive autofocus mode where the camera is tracking movement within the image frame rather than a specific spot, it's much easier to keep your focus locked on that bird as it's flying. All right, in that same vein, we just got a question submitted live by Gary, and he's looking for techniques to shoot birds that are maybe like in front of trees or in a cloudy sky, how do you get the bird to pop out in the frame there? Oh, uh, Gary, thanks, that's a great question. We're getting a lot of bird questions so far. Uh, I guess bird photography is, is, is fairly popular. Uh, so with any photograph, I think what you want to do is have visual separation. And this is a challenge of working in a two-dimensional artistic medium. Uh, in, in the real world, our eyes perceive things in three dimensions. So we see that eagle 
or that bird standing out from the cloud behind it. But when you squish things down to a two-dimensional uh, artistic medium, that visual separation that our eyes perceive might get lost. So the animal might not stand out from that background. So one thing you need to do is look for some contrast so that the animal stands out from the background. Now, it, for example, if you're shooting a, a dark bird, let's say a bald eagle, which has got uh, black feathers except for the white head, uh, black and brown feathers, if you've got a white cloud behind it, the white cloud's going to be brighter than the eagle, so that's going to be good from a contrast point of view. But unfortunately, because the cloud is brighter than the eagle, uh, that's not necessarily going to be good for the photograph because the white cloud is going to be more attractive to the viewer's eye than the dark eagle. So ideally what you'd want to have is some bright sunlight on the eagle so that the eagle's brighter and that allows it to stand out from its background. So you still want to have that, that contrast, if you can, between the background and the subject, but I think having some light on your subject, first of all, is really going to help it stand out a lot more. So especially, I, I used to do a lot of eagle photography when I lived in Virginia on the Potomac River. There were hundreds of eagles there uh, where I lived. In fact, there was a bald eagle's nest in my uh, next door neighbor's backyard. I could literally take photos of the eagle's nest by opening my front door and just having my tripod set up uh, inside my house. Uh, as a matter of fact, I did a book on the Chesapeake Bay where one of the photos was of a bald eagle in a snowstorm, and I, I literally took it from inside my house with the door open looking out. I didn't go outside because it was snowing too hard. Uh, so that was a great uh, experience, and it allowed me to, to experiment a lot with techniques to, to photograph eagles, especially against the sky. And I found usually that the best kind of light was to shoot uh, in the early morning or the late afternoon on a clear day or when there was some strong sunlight. So I had this golden sunrise or sunset light uh, lighting up the eagle as it was flying against the sky. And the best background for that might have been some, some heavy storm clouds that were in the background that were in shadow. So the eagle is brightly lit in the foreground and there's these shadowed storm clouds in the background. So the eagle, because it's brighter, stands out. And there's also some color contrast. So you have the warm light on the eagle and then you have the cooler, darker, uh, colors of the clouds in the background and that created this really nice visual contrast that helps separate the eagle from the background sky. Cool. We've been getting a lot of questions that are kind of in the same vein and segueing really nicely. You've been talking a lot about natural light and how to incorporate that mm -hmm. in your photographs. So John asks, and this doesn't apply just to like bird photography or eagle photography, what's your favorite time of day to photograph wildlife, dawn or dusk, for natural light purposes? Well, that, that, this is a fantastic question. Uh, I, you know, I've been shooting landscape photography primarily for a long time, and wildlife photography is something that I I kind of branched into and now I do a, quite a bit of it and I bring a lot of landscape photography techniques to my wildlife photography so I really love photographing wildlife during the times of day that I might otherwise be doing landscape photography so there's not a lot of middle of the day photography for me mm -hmm. there's a lot of sunrise and sunset and uh, twilight or night photography so I enjoy working in sunrise and sunset light when the lights very strong you can get some colorful light on the animal and you can get some really great shadows that can uh, enhance the composition. My favorite type of wildlife photography is to photograph at the edge of light. At, during twilight, you know, maybe when there's still some sunset color in the sky but the, the landscape itself is in shadow so the animal's in shadow. Uh, or even a little bit later after the sun is set and you get those uh, deep rich blues of twilight as you're moving into the dark of night. And then I use artificial light typically flash to illuminate the animal and uh, that really causes it to pop out from the surrounding landscape and uh, it's a really nice artistic effect. Now when I'm using flash with wildlife, whether it's during the twilight hours or even if I'm just using flash to add a little fill light when I'm shooting at different times of the day, uh, just in case the animal's in shadow and I want to bring out its tone and texture a little bit more, Whenever I am using flash, I'm usually dialing back on the flash power using flash compensation on the camera or the flash. And uh, almost always shooting at minus two or minus three flash compensation. So I'm softening the light of the flash. It's not that strong. What you want to do is avoid that over flashed look when you're photographing animals. So by dialing back the power, it's a softer, uh, light, it's, it, there's less shadows being created, it's less harsh, it's much more natural looking and it can be a really nice complement to a wider wildlife photography scene where you might have a beautiful twilight sky in the background or something like that. So uh, using artificial flash to augment 
the light when you're working in these low light conditions can be very powerful artistically. All right, next question makes me think of, you have some photographs of that you got like a lion and a leopard in the dark and it's like around mm -hmm. the Maasai tribe area. Mm -hmm. You did a few photo photographs like that. And George asked specifically, how do you avoid eye shine in those sort of photographs when you're photographing predators at mm -hmm. night? And he has a clarification here. I know the flash should be away from the lens, but how do I place it far away so that it turns when the lens turns is the challenge and a meteor long flash arm won't work on a vehicle? Okay, well, so uh, uh, he's absolutely right. Uh, the best thing you can do is to have the flash uh, away from the camera, but it doesn't have to necessarily be that far away to avoid the eye shine. So typically just getting the flash a few inches away from the camera so it's not uh, shining light directly into the eyes at the same angle that the camera is pointing is enough. So a lot of times photographers will use a flash bracket which basically just connects to the camera and there's an L bracket that goes off to the side that you mount the flash on and you have a cord that connects the two and that's usually enough to prevent that eye shine look. Another thing you can do, once again, dialing back on the flash power so it's not as powerful. That helps reduce the look of eye shine. Now, so the, the photos that, uh, that you were referencing, uh, which were taken in Kenya, uh, during the twilight hours. Uh, those were actually illuminated using a spotlight. So I had uh, my driver of my safari vehicle, he would shine the spotlight and he'd be several feet away from me. Uh, so the spotlight is, uh, is a great way to light up the animal uh, uh, and also helps avoid the eye shine problem if you have an assistant or someone else who's with you who's standing a few feet away to shine the, the light at a different angle. But even usually just getting the flash a few inches away so it's not coming at the eyes at that same angle as the camera is enough to help mitigate eye shine. All right, and as we're going along here, I just want to remind and kind of clarify for people who may be joining us, maybe 15 minutes in, a little late, we're here with the Outdoor Photography Guide live event focusing specifically on wildlife photography, and I want to remind you to keep asking questions live so we can bring them in and answer them right here. So our next one kind of goes along in the same vein of this, and it says, so much wildlife photography seems to be in low light situations, which is kind of difficult, and it's very specific here. It seems to get the shutter speed. You need to capture a sharp image. You need to increase the ISO, which then introduces noise to the image. So what's your advice on handling these shots and avoiding so much digital noise? Okay, well, yes, and this, this is a very good point. Um, as you're working in these lower light conditions, you have to make compromises. So either you have to reduce your shutter speed so that you can let in enough light to, uh, to get a sharp, uh, a good quality image, uh, or you need to increase your ISO to let in enough light. And they both have their penalties. So if you use uh, lower shutter speeds, at some point uh, you're going to start introducing shake into the image. So a lot of wildlife photography is done handheld, or if you're working from a safari vehicle, for example, uh, you might be using a beanbag support. Uh, I do use a tripod for a lot of my wildlife photography. Uh, but even when you're working on a stable support like a tripod, uh, if you're using uh, low shutter speeds, like 1 30th of a second, 1 15th of a second or less, you can uh, still have problems if the animal's moving. Uh, so it might prevent you from getting a sharp image. So uh, a lot of times you end up having to increase your ISO to compensate. And here working with a good camera that can handle high ISOs capably is very important. So. I tend to use, if I can, a full frame camera versus a crop sensor camera because usually the full frame cameras handle high ISO noise better. They, they have less digital noise that's created uh, when you're using high ISOs. And of course there are, are a number of high end full frame cameras that are, are really good at working at super high ISOs. But today the digital camera technology has increased and enhanced so much that a lot of crop sensor cameras and a lot of even some of the lower end prosumer cameras handle high ISOs very well. So you can still get quality images when you're working in the twilight. Now, uh, another thing to keep in mind is if you're mixing some flash in with the ambient light, that's going, going to increase your image quality because it's going to add more light to the subject. So you might be able to get away with using um, lower ISOs when you're incorporating flash. And what I typically do in situations like that is I underexpose the image generally. Uh, and that allows the, the, the image in the background to go darker. So quite often I have a, a bright uh, sky in the background and I'll underexpose it a bit uh, and then use the flash to illuminate my subject or the spotlight 
and this balances the exposure between the two and that keeps me from having to use super high ISOs or from using really, really slow shutter speeds. Uh, another thing I also do is as the light uh, drops, I switch over to my faster lenses and you know, ideally shooting with an f2.8 lens or even faster is great when you're working in these low light conditions. Uh, so there might be some lenses that I'm no longer using in these low light conditions, like some of my longer telephoto lenses that are f4 or f5.6 with a teleconverter added on or something like that. These options become less usable in low light conditions. And I also, I start working with wider angle lenses because you can get away with slower shutter speeds with a wider angle of view and still get a sharp image. So for example, if I'm working in the twilight while on African safari, uh, and if I'm close to a lion, I can take out my 24 millimeter uh, 1.4 uh, lens, which lets in a lot of light. I know I can shoot with that wide angle of view at 1 30th of a second as opposed to 1 300th of a second with a longer lens. So this gives me a lot more flexibility. But it's always a trade-off. Uh, something has to give as the light goes down. My advice is no matter what, just keep shooting. Uh, if it turns out that you ended up using too high of an ISO and the image is too noisy, well, you might not be able to use that photo at all. But if you didn't shoot it in the first place, then you never would have been able to use it. So I do a lot of experimentation. I look at the images as they're coming on my, on my uh, camera LCD screen. I zoom in to check the noise levels. I make compromises. You know, a lot of times by, by going to a slower shutter speed, you might not get sharp images. But if you shoot a lot of photos, Maybe one out of five will be sharp if you're using a shutter speed that's just a little too slow for comfort. Just kind of fire off a burst and every now and then you'll get a lucky sharp shot. So just do the best you can, make the compromises that you need to make, but keep shooting anyways because if you do get lucky and you get something good in those really extreme conditions and you've got something usable, if you just gave up and stopped shooting, then you've got nothing. Everything's a learning experience, right? You've got to take bad photographs to get good ones out of there. <laughs> well, I, I, I take a lot of bad photographs. That's the secret to my success. So the good ones you see are the, are the product of literally thousands and thousands of bad shots. It is a lot of experimentation. There is uh, a joke that a lot of photographers use, which is spray and pray, which means just take as many photos <laughs> as you can and hope that there's some divine intercession that creates a good photo. And I tell people to... Uh, to use this strategy, but to, but to have a method to your madness. You know, I don't spray and pray. I've got an idea in mind of what it is that I want, but sometimes I find that you have to take a lot of different test shots and experiment a lot, and sometimes you just have to shoot, shoot, shoot uh, to just keep the process going to really figure out how to make it work. They do say that good phot photographers are the bad photographers that never gave up. <laughs> a little bit of sage wisdom. Exhibit A. <laughs> okay, a little clarification going back to ISO. Do you ever use auto ISO for wildlife shooting, or do you find that's a little lack of control there? I use auto ISO almost always for oh. wildlife shooting, and it, I think it's a great way to, to be shooting and not be thinking about the fact that light might be changing. So if you set your ISO to a certain level, if the light changes, then you have to continually change your ISO to adapt to the changing light. If you're shooting auto ISO, uh, then what happens is that as the light changes, the camera will automatically increase or decrease the ISO. So for me, it's a really great way to think more about my artistic process and not worry so much about the technical things. Now, when you're shooting in any auto mode on your camera, you have to make sure that you're still part of the decision-making process for the overall exposure. So it's critical to learn how to use exposure compensation when you're shooting, whether it's auto ISO or auto aperture or auto shutter speed. Any of these automatic modes, the camera is making a guess about the proper exposure. And I don't know, maybe 75% of the time the camera makes a very good guess. But you still need to be in control of the process, especially if the camera makes the wrong guess or if you're looking to do a creative artistic exposure, either intentionally overexposed or underexposed for a creative effect, it's critical to learn how to use exposure compensation. You can add more exposure or decrease your exposure until you get it right. So when you're working with auto ISO, always make sure that you are reviewing the exposure choices your camera is making and using exposure compensation as necessary to correct any mistakes the camera's making. Also, another thing to, to watch out for. Now, I don't 
I don't set a maximum ISO when I'm shooting auto ISO. Uh, once again, under the theory that, yeah, there may be ISOs that are so high that the image will be completely use, uh, useless because it's too noisy. But if I don't take those shots, I'll never know. And sometimes you'd be surprised at how well your camera handles high ISO situations. It's critical to look at your photos when you're taking them. Every now and then, pull one up, zoom into 100% on your camera's LCD, and see how noisy it's getting. If you're getting past uh, 3,200 ISO, especially if you're getting up to 10,000 ISO or higher, uh, you're probably going to start seeing a lot of digital noise. One thing that's critical when you're shooting with these higher ISOs is to make sure you have a proper exposure. And by proper exposure, I mean push the histogram as much to the right as possible without overexposing any of your highlights. The more that the overall exposure of the image is shifted to uh, a brighter image, the cleaner the image files will be. So if you end up underexposing your image and you use high ISO, when you later try to open up that file when you're processing it to give it more exposure, you're going to see a lot of noise. But I have taken high ISO shots at ISO 5000 or 10,000 or higher where I had a really good, clean, bright exposure and I've been surprised at how little noise shows up in those files. You, you can still make a really clean, usable file. It won't be as good as the same shot at ISO 100, but it might still be very usable. So Definitely use auto ISO. There might be times when you specifically want to turn it off uh, and control the, the lighting and exposure situation more, but I use auto ISO almost all the time when I'm shooting wildlife. Mm -hmm. All right, what's the best way to follow wildlife movement when shooting with a really long, heavy lens like the Tamron 150 to 600 millimeter? <laughs> okay, I think, uh, I think I answered this in part earlier. Um, you know, one thing you can do is you can zoom out while you're tracking your subject, and then when you're ready to take the shot, you can zoom in. Uh, and get the framing that you want. This takes a little bit of practice and it's certainly easier to do if your camera is su supported by something, so if you're not completely hand holding it. So if you're working on a tripod or if you're using a beanbag support, this makes it easier for you to do the movement and zoom at the same time. But it's something you can still do with most lenses handheld. So if you're working on a tripod or if you can work on a tripod, a lot of photographers get what is known as a gimbal head, which is a specially designed uh, uh, head tripod head for long lenses and it's got a bit of a L shape to it and it's designed to keep the the lens on its center of gravity so that you can easily move the lens up and down left and right uh, and pan and track a subject uh, without actually having to hold the lens physically in your hands so it takes the weight off your arms and it's a very fluid movement and it makes it a lot easier to track a subject. So I think that this is the, the type of equipment that you can use to greatly enhance your wildlife photography. But it's something you can only use with a tripod. So once again, if you're on African safari and you're shooting from uh, the vehicle and you've got a beanbag support, it, obviously you're not going to be able to use the gimbal head. But even a beanbag support can make it a lot easier for you to move and track with a subject without having your arms get tired. All right, our next question, maybe you'll have some good stories for us, but Aaron asks if you can share some tips for photographing wildlife babies. They often seem a little more skittish than the parents and mm -hmm. might be a little difficult to get a good capture of. So what are your tips and tricks on that? Well, uh, that, that's a really good question. And uh, I guess wildlife babies uh, depend. Some wildlife babies are more skittish than the adults. Uh, and a lot of times wildlife babies are more precocious than the adults. <laughs> so it can, it can either be more difficult uh, sometimes it can be a lot easier to photograph the babies. Uh, I think the, the key thing either way, whether you've got a skittish baby or whether you've got a precocious baby, the thing you want to worry about the most is making sure that the parent uh, is comfortable. So if the parent is uncomfortable, uh, then that skittish baby will, will be much more likely to hide because uh, the parent will tell it to hide. And if uh, you're working with a precocious baby and the, and the parent's uncomfortable, then the parent will pull that baby back. <laughs> so uh, the best thing you can do is to keep mom happy. And well, that's usually good advice uh, for anyone, uh, whether you're <laughs> dating uh, or whether you are uh, photographing wildlife, is keep the parents happy. <laughs>
All right, Carrie says that they are be a beginner wildlife photographer, and what do you think is the best lens to start to learn and begin on wildlife photography with, like train on, sort of? So I, I'm gonna speak in generalities. I, I try to avoid getting too specific with equipment just because A, I'm not familiar with every system out there. There's many different camera systems, and uh, B, uh, I hesitate to give very specific equipment advice to people mm -hmm. because everyone has different needs uh, and a different budget. But I think that generally when you're starting out with wildlife photography, you want to start out with a zoom lens. So you want to get one of the telephoto zooms. That gives you a lot of flexibility. So that's a great way to learn how to do different compositions and it gives you several lenses in one. Now there's a lot of advanced wildlife photographers that will shoot with fixed focal length lenses, uh, prime lenses like a, like a 500 millimeter or a 600 millimeter and they do this because these lenses often offer superior quality and they also typically will allow you to shoot in lower light than the zoom lenses because they have a a larger maximum aperture so you might be with a big pro prime lens you might have f2.8 Whereas with a, a zoom lens, the widest aperture might be f4 or f5.6. So there's a little bit of a penalty when you're shooting with these zoom lenses. Uh, you typically have to use higher ISOs when you're working with these lenses because they don't let in quite as much light. And as the result, your images might be a little bit noisier and have lower image quality. But a good flexible zoom will allow you to shoot a variety of situations. You can zoom in tight and you can get a nice frame filling portrait of the animal, you can zoom out and you can practice working with showing animals in the context of their environment, going for more of an environmental portrait of the animal. Uh, and these lenses tend to be cheaper as well. So there's a number of really good lenses out there. Uh, for example, I, I work with Tamron a lot, so I've had some experience with the Tamron 150 to 600 millimeter lens, which has got a great range for wildlife photography. Uh, Sigma also has a really fantastic 150 to 600 millimeter lens, and there's some other options out there. You know, Canon and Nikon, of course, have got some fantastic lenses, like Canon's got their 100 to 400, uh, and Nikon's got some similar lenses as well. Uh, these are all high quality, inexpensive zoom lenses that will allow you to get fabulous wildlife shots uh, and not spend a lot of money for it. All right, and we have a question from Anya here, another kind of equipment question, but not about specifically what to purchase, but what's a good technique when you're photographing animals in the rain? She's always worried that her camera's gonna get ruined and how may you avoid that? So Anya always chimes in with questions about protecting equipment from the rain. Very she, concerned. she forgets that she already did this in our previous episode. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, which I think I answered this question already. So here it is again for you, Anya, uh, with a smile. Uh, so one thing you can do is you can go out and buy a lens cover. There are a number of companies that offer, they make these lens coats or lens covers that you can drape over your lens that will help uh, keep your, both your lens and your camera uh, dry when you're working in the rain. Using a lens hood is a great idea as well because that'll help protect the front element of the lens, uh, especially if there's a bit of wind and the, the rain's moving around. Don't shoot directly into the rain if it's blowing right at you, even with a lens hood, that's not gonna help much. Uh, I think there's, a, there's a, a broader question though to be asked about shooting in the rain is whether it's a good idea or whether it can be artistic uh, whether there's any artistic advantage to shooting in the rain. Uh, and I, I think the answer is yes, there can be. A lot of times if it's raining really hard, I won't bother uh, shooting because if, if, it, if there's too much rain, it diffuses the scene too much, you can't really see the animal. But if you've got some blowing rain going by or some blowing snow, that can help diffuse the overall look of the image uh, and that can create an artistic look. So I use that a lot. For example, when I go up and I photograph polar bears in the Arctic, uh, I love it when there's a really heavy snowstorm because all that blowing snow in the scene really adds to the overall mood and enhances the drama and helps tell the story better. And uh, a lot of animals look really great wet. Now my, my cats at home, they look ridiculous when they're wet, uh, but a lot of animals when, when their hair, their, their feathers or their uh, hair is matted down by the rain, it, they, they, they look fantastic. So it can be really artistic to shoot in the rain or right after it's rained. So definitely look into using a lens coat or a lens hood. Uh, you know, a lot of professional cameras have weather sealing. Uh, so I actually don't do anything to protect my, my equipment um, because I know my equipment's very well weather sealed when I'm using it. Uh, but for most, most of you, I think it's pretty simple. 
Uh, you can either buy one of these things or you can just throw a jacket or a coat over your lens and your camera while you're shooting and that'll protect it just as well as anything else. All right, here's a bit of an interesting question from Francis. If you're going on an African safari and you are flying on a small airline, what are some tips for getting around luggage limits or packing the bare minimum essentials? Well, this is a great question and it's something that uh, I, I have to deal with a lot. I travel all over the place uh, with my photographic equipment. So I do always try to pack as light as possible. So for me, instead of carrying a bunch of expensive, big prime lenses, I, I shoot with a, a zoom lens for most of my wildlife photography. So I'm bringing my Canon 200 to 400 millimeter lens with a built-in one four extension. And that gives me a really good super telephoto range in one lens and it's not that big. So that right there helps me cut down on the equipment weight. So I do my best to, to minimize what I bring, but you know, even so, I'll have my, my 200 to 400, then I'll often have a 70 to 200 with me, and then I'll have an assortment of wider lenses, and then I'll have my flash, uh, and sometimes I'll even have my tripod. That does begin to add up. I'm carrying that all on my back instead of checking it in my luggage uh, for security concerns. I don't want my equipment stolen on the way there or damaged. Uh, and so as airlines get increasingly restrictive about carry-on uh, weight, this can be a problem. Now I found that usually as long as I have the equipment in a backpack that's not too obviously big, uh, airline personnel don't ask to weigh the bag. They, they just assume it's not that big or heavy. Usually that when they're targeting overhead bin space, they're looking at the roller bags. So I found that that's one way to sneak on and usually not um, have my equipment get weighed. Uh, also, a lot of times, especially when you're traveling in Africa, for example, there are some airports there where they tell you not to check anything that's expensive. They say, don't check any electronics. So they, I think they're a little understanding of the fact that you might be carrying a lot of expensive equipment that you can't check. So I just tell that to airline personnel. If they do ask about the bag, I say, look, I've got about $30,000 worth of camera equipment in here. I really want to carry this on. And usually they find a way to accommodate you. Now, if, if you still uh, end up being told that your bag is too heavy, uh, what I, I almost always do is I have a secondary bag where I carry my laptop, which is they almost never weigh in a situation like that because uh, it goes, it doesn't go in the overhead bin, it goes under my feet. If I really need to, I'll start stuffing some of my lenses and my flash uh, in that secondary carry-on. And a lot of photographers will carry like a, they'll wear a photo vest. So if they need to, they can stuff some lenses in their photo vest. Uh, for some reason, they don't care if you do that. Like, it's okay to be heavy on a plane. They're just trying to restrict the weight that's in the overhead bins because the bins are only rated to a certain weight. Uh, so usually there's a way around it. I've never ever had a situation in all my travels where I've been told I had to check my camera gear or do something drastic like that. Though I have heard stories of that occasionally happening. But usually if you explain what you have and they understand how expensive the equipment is, they'll figure out a way to make it work for you. All right, and as some more time has lapsed, I just want to let everyone know who may be joining us a little later, welcome to the Outdoor Photography Guide live event on specifically wildlife photography, and make sure that you're always asking us questions in the live feed so we can answer them right here. Our next question is maybe like if you're on an African safari and you have to stay restricted in a vehicle, what are your advice, what's your advice on getting some low angle shots when you might not be able to get out and on the ground? Well, that, that's a great question. Um, so typically with safari vehicles, uh, most of the safari vehicles in, in Africa have a pop-up option, but not all of them do. So the pop-up option allows you to stand and shoot, but you're very high. Uh, most of those vehicles also have windows, so you can, instead of standing, you can be sitting in the vehicle and shooting out of the window. And that allows a lower perspective, but to get even lower than that, you have to work with a specially outfitted vehicle, and there are these vehicles occasionally available for photographers. What they do is they take out the door, uh, one of the doors to allow you access into the vehicle. For example, I've worked in one in Kenya where the, the guide took out his door and replaced it with a plastic, clear plastic door that is attached with Velcro. And so whenever uh, I want to shoot at a lower angle, he'll just uh, take the door off 
and I can lie down at the bottom of the vehicle and I can shoot out from the bottom of the door. So there are some vehicles that are specially made for photographers that are out there and this is becoming something more re that's more requested by photographers and is becoming more uh, popular but it's still relatively uncommon. You know another interesting uh, thing that has become uh, something that a lot of uh, places in Africa are doing. It, it, so it won't be when you're on uh, safari in your vehicle, but it may be back when you're in camp. A lot of the camps are now building underground hides. So they'll have a water hole and they'll build a hide that's underground. And so you can go in the hide and you can shoot out of the holes that they have for viewing the animals as they come into the water holes. And you have a ground level perspective with the animals. So I would recommend when you are researching locations for an African safari to look to see if you have either of those underground hide or modified vehicle options available to you. Uh, if not, uh, then you're just stuck with the perspectives that are offered by the vehicles. Quite often, the higher perspectives are better because a lot of times when you're shooting on the African savanna, there's grass. So getting down low, you can't see the animals anyways. Uh, but especially like, for example, in uh, the Serengeti or Masamara of Kenya, when the wildebeest come in and they literally mow the grass down, getting that lower perspective can be good. Just one thing to keep in mind when you're hanging out of a low perspective option in a safari vehicle, that if a lion or a cheetah or a leopard gets a little close, to keep your arms inside because you, <laughs> <laughs> they move fast and they will pull people out if they, uh, if they sense an opportunity. So just always be very alert and listen to what your guide is saying. Stay inside the vehicle as much as you possibly can. <laughs> Stay safe, yeah, for sure. definitely. All right, we got a lot of questions about African safari trips in general here, and we have one from Larry who said mm -hmm. that he has done a lot of research on doing an African safari and has a general consensus of advice to shoot aperture priority. Mm -hmm. With the potential to be shooting action shots, why wouldn't you initially have your camera set on shutter priority? This is a fantastic question, Larry. Thank you for asking it. I do hear that a lot from wildlife photographers, that you should shoot aperture priority. And, I, and the, the reason why they say this is that almost always when you're shooting wildlife, you want to use a wide open aperture to creatively blur the background. You want the animal in focus, but you want the background blurred so the animal stands out more. And this is generally good advice. but uh, I think that more important than that, you want to control your shutter speed. So I almost always shoot in shutter priority when I'm shooting wildlife because that's the most important variable is the shutter speed. You want to capture a sharp image. If animals are moving around, you want to set your shutter speed to something like 1 500th of a second or maybe 1 1,000th of a second, like if you're shooting birds in the sky, for example, that are flying fast. Um, and Almost always I found that when I'm shooting in shutter priority with a combination of auto ISO, I'm, unless it's very bright out, I end up with the widest open aperture anyways. Because what the camera does is it will immediately default before you know, raising the ISO, it is going to uh, open up the aperture to let in light. And then once it reaches the maximum aperture, that's when it'll start increasing ISO. So I'm not typically photographing wildlife in the brightest part of the day. I'm working more in the morning and evening and the twilight periods. So by default, there's just not enough light. So if I'm shooting at 1 500th of a second, the camera is always picking the widest open aperture and uh, maybe increasing the ISO to compensate to give me enough light. So it's not a problem. If I do find myself shooting in a bright brighter environment, I will keep an eye on the aperture that my camera is picking. And if I decide that the camera is stopping down to smaller apertures uh, because it's too bright out and it's trying to keep my shutter speed where it is, then I might switch over to aperture priority to ensure I get that blurred out background. But for the most part, I shoot shutter priority and it's only an issue. That, that aperture is only an issue if you're shooting in bright light, but if you're shooting in lower light situations or if you're using a really high shutter speed, almost always your camera is defaulting to the widest open aperture. Just pay attention when you're shooting and make sure it's not stopping down to something smaller if that's a concern for you. All right, we got a post-processing question here. Or if you have any advice on capturing fine details in your post-processing, specifically in fur and feathers on subjects you're shooting. 
Well, this is um, this is an interesting question, and I might need a moment to, to think about it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna talk as if I know what I'm talking about, <laughs> but it might be a few minutes of babble before I actually collect my thoughts. Uh, so when I'm processing my wildlife images, I tend to do it with a very light touch, uh, because you know landscape images I think will uh, look better with a with extra contrast and color, uh, but with wildlife images you want to be a, you want to be careful to push that too far because. I think what hap you know a wildlife subject is very recognizable to people. We know that that a lion isn't bright orange. So if you push the saturation too much, it's pretty pretty obvious. And I think those those photos tend to look better with a light touch, anyways. Uh, I also don't typically do much to the file to bring out that feather detail. Like one thing you can do is to sharpen the file. But I when I'm processing my images, I almost never. Uh, add any sharpening to the base image. I only sharpen for output because sharpening is a destructive process. Now if you're doing sharpening in Lightroom you can always go back to the original file and remove the sharpening. There's no problems with that. But sharpening is a destructive process so if you're sharpening the base file and then you're enlarging or reducing that file for, you know, if you're enlarging it for printing for example, uh, the sharpening you've done to the base file will have introduced artifacts that if you do an extreme blow up uh, might not look very good. So what, what I typically do is I'll do those adjustments only when I'm ready to output the file. So if I'm making a big print I'll enlarge the print and then I'll sharpen it to, to taste uh, for specifically de designed for that output. So you can sharpen a file to enhance that feather detail but I would do that cautiously. Uh, you can also increase clarity which is which is another way of sharpening basically. Clarity is designed to adjust what's known as micro contrast or midtone contrast. So it gives the image a bit more pop and this can make um, feather details stand out. It's a less destructive process than sharpening. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, some earlier versions of Lightroom, Clarity was a, was a bit more destructive and Clarity has increasingly gotten less destructive. It's gotten better. So I, I tend, you know, I, I usually avoid sharpening to increase the detail, but I will uh, sometimes use clarity to enhance the, the look and detail of feathers and uh, fur. Once again, you want to avoid going too far and just remember that you should really be making these adjustments based on final output because the sharpening and clarity you might apply to an image when you're making a big print will be different than when you are putting a small image on the internet. So I tend to make these adjustments uh, during the output phase and not worry about it so much at the beginning phase. All right, we have a live question from Mary who asks, if you're in a situation where you have to shoot through a window to capture an animal, do you have any advice on that so it doesn't look super blurry or you're getting a lot of the exposure via the window? Mary, that's a great question. My advice is to never shoot through a window. <laughs> so, uh, and I've, I've certainly done this, especially uh, vehicle windows. Um, mm -hmm. If you, there's, there's a problem with shooting through vehicle windows, is, and I'm not, I'm, I don't know the optics or the physics of it, but uh, you, uh, it, depending on your angle, it, it distorts the, uh, the quality of the image. So I, I don't know what it is exactly that does it, but I have noticed that you actually, it's difficult to get a sharp image when you're shooting through uh, window glass in a vehicle, especially if it's angled like the front windshield. Something about it um, bends the light or something, and it just doesn't look that good. Uh, but if you're shooting in, in clear glass, I mean, so whenever you're taking a picture, you're shooting through glass. Your lens uh, is glass. So there's nothing about uh, glass itself that's problematic. So if you're shooting in clear, flat glass, uh, for example, like out of a house window, it's a, it's a much cleaner look than if you're shooting through that angled vehicle glass. But there's a few things you can do. One, uh, reflection is, is something that can degrade your image quality when you're shooting in the glass. There might be a reflection in the glass. So the best way to avoid having that reflection show up in your image is to block out as much of what's behind you as, as you can. So ideally if you had a dark blanket that you could throw over yourself and throw over the window so that everything that's behind you is blocked and there is no opportunity for that to reflect on the window that you're shooting through that will make the, uh, the file, that'll make the image look a lot better. I've also noticed that, that sometimes when I try to shoot through vehicle glass that the autofocus has some problems locking on. Once again, I think it's that, that same thing that's degrading the image quality. Um, so that's a consideration as well. You may have to switch over to, to manual focus uh, if necessary. 
So, as I said, my best advice is just avoid shooting through glass if you can. And if you have to shoot through glass, make sure it's flat glass that hasn't been treated. You know, you have no pro almost no problem shooting through like window glass in a house or a building. That's usually, you know, usually reflections are your only problem there and that's easily solved. But when you're shooting through that, that angled, uh, maybe treated or tinted glass of a vehicle, you'll have all sorts of problems. All right, we have another question from Francis, and it's a bit broad, so maybe you could go through a few different examples, some situations. And Francis asks, can you talk a little bit about how slash when you use flash in your wildlife photography mm -hmm. and best practices? Okay, yeah, yeah, and I did talk about this a little bit earlier. Yeah. Uh, so the times I'm using flash, uh, well, actually, the truth of the matter is I, I use flash a lot with my wildlife photography. If there's a lot of bright ambient light, if the subject's front lit, there's really no point in using flash. Uh, the front lighting itself is illuminating the animal and especially if it's at a good time of the day when you've got some soft colorful light uh, then there's no need for augmentation. When I'm using flash is typically when uh, the animal might be in shadow and its surroundings might be brighter so I'm using flash to add a little bit of fill light so the animal stands out better um, and also when I'm working in lower light conditions. So for example, when I'm uh, shooting at sunrise or sunset, uh, I might be using flash to, uh, to augment the light on the animal. If I'm photographing orangutans in the rainforest, I'll use a little bit of fill flash uh, just so that the animal stands out a bit more from that dark rainforest environment in the background, so create some separation. You know, so flash is also very useful when you're working in flat light, so overcast light there's not going to be any light that separates the animal from its background. So adding a little bit of fill flash will help it stand out more. That fill will enhance the color and the contrast. You know, the earlier question about processing for feather and fur detail, uh, well, the flash is a great way to bring out a little extra detail in the fur and the feathers. But as I said earlier, the best practice I can advise is to not use the flash at full power, to dial back using flash compensation or if you're setting the flash manually, uh, just reducing its power. With flash compensation, I'm almost always shooting at minus two or minus three. If you're farther away from the animal and you're reaching the edge of the, the flash's power range, then you might not have to dial back with flash compensation. It might naturally, the light will naturally start falling off. But in any event, you want to avoid that full-on flashed look, that obvious flashed look. So dialing back the flash is always a good thing and for a lot of animals where you might end up getting uh, some sort of light in the eye uh, like with cats uh, having the, the the flash just a little bit off axis from the camera uh, using a flash bracket will help you avoid those situations flash is also useful if you want to get a catch light in the animal's eye uh, and so if you've got once again natural front lighting it, you can get that natural catch light, but if you don't have that natural front lighting for the animal, the flash can help you get a, uh, a catch light in the eye. And the catch light just brings life to the eye, and it also focuses attention on the animal's eye because that little bright uh, speck of light will automatically attract the viewer's eye, so the eyes become a stronger focal point of the composition. I have found, however, that flash catch lights don't look quite as good as natural catch lights, so I prefer to have the natural catch light if I can. All right. Um, question in terms of wildlife photography, do you think that filters are worth the investment or is software so, so good now that post-processing can kind of sort out those issues after the fact for you? Well, for wildlife photography, I'm tending not to use filters at all. So I don't really think it's a, an issue. Uh, you know, landscape photography, there's, there's usually more use for filters. Uh, sometimes with wildlife photography, you may want to use a polarizer filter. If you're photographing an animal that's in the water, and a polarizer is designed to get rid of unwanted reflections uh, in wet surfaces. So if there are some, some you know, unsuitable uh, glare or reflections you don't like in a, in a scene that's got water or wet surfaces, uh, you might use a polarizer in those circumstances. But 99.99% of the time, I don't use filters for my wildlife photography at all. All right. Live question from Jay, do you have any recommendations for shooting wildlife in the snow? Any unique ticks, techniques or equipment that you use in winter or snow photography for wildlife? This is a great question. I love photographing animals in the snow. Uh, you know, the, the heavier the snowstorm, the better. Uh, certainly when you're photographing uh, uh, winter wildlife, it's good to photograph them when the landscape has just been snowed upon. So there's 
a lot of deep snow. You don't want twigs and dead trees and things like that sticking out because uh, it just makes it look barren. But if you've got a nice thick snowfall that the animals uh, walking through or sleeping in or whatever, uh, that's a much cleaner background and it looks a lot nicer. And uh, I like shooting when the snow is falling, especially thick, heavy, wet snow, because it adds an ethereal uh, 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 sort of uh, gauze, you know, Gaussian blur look to the image. It helps diffuse the image, and it helps tell a story. Uh, you know, the animal walking in the snowstorm or, or doing something like that can, can just uh, really tell viewers something about the winter environment. The, the key technical advice I have for shooting in, in snow is to remember that your camera meter is easily fooled when you're shooting a scene that is essentially white. So your camera meter is designed to try to make the overall exposure neutral. So if you're shooting, for example, a bright white wall, the camera is going to underexpose that image because it's going to want to make it look neutral gray and vice versa if you're shooting a black wall. It's going to overexpose the image because uh, it wants to make that look neutral gray. So you have to use exposure compensation to get the camera to meter the scene correctly. So when you're shooting when there's a lot of snow, uh, then you're going to want to increase your exposure compensation. So I'm often shooting at plus one, plus two, or even as much as plus three to make sure that the final exposure looks correct. So if you've got, you know, for example, I have, a, I have a lot of photographs of polar bears in snowstorms. So it's pretty much white on white. And in those situations, I'm often using somewhere between plus two and plus three exposure compensation to make sure I get the proper exposure. If I just let the camera meter it on its own using shutter priority or aperture priority, what's going to happen is that the camera is going to underexpose that image and everything's going to come out looking gray and flat. Uh, and when it's underexposed, you also get more uh, digital noise. So it's important to, in to increase your exposure compensation so that the, uh, the metering is perfect. So you want to keep pushing it to the point where the histogram is all the way to the right of the graph, but you don't want to actually overexpose any of those whites. So you want to avoid the blinkies if you've got your exposure highlight warning on, uh, and you want to avoid pushing the histogram to the right of the graph so you get the spike on the right side of the histogram graph. You want to avoid overexposing your highlights, but I will push my exposure as high as I can before I overexpose any of the whites to get the proper exposure. All right, we've talked a lot today about birds and tracking birds in flight, but would you say the techniques are similar or different if you're tracking an animal that's moving and taking an action shot running? How would that be different from tracking a bird in flight? Uh, well, the techniques are actually fairly similar, except that a bird can uh, has got a, a freer range of movement. It can go up, down, left, right, away from you, closer to you, whereas the animal is a little bit uh, more restricted. Um, so I think that... Uh, the, the best advice I have is when you're, when you're photographing animals that are moving is to uh, make sure that you choose the correct image stabilization mode. A lot of these uh, lenses and cameras have image stabilization with multiple modes so that you can shoot, uh, you can pan with subjects depending on their, their range of movement. So one mode would be good for left to right movement. Another mode is good for you know, an animal that might be coming closer or farther away from you. The, the, these camera models have all these different modes. Uh, a lot of the cameras now are offering an automatic mode that will decide which way you're moving the lens up, down, left, right, or whether the subject's coming closer to you or not. So just get familiar with the panning modes and make sure that when you're panning with the subject that you choose the right mode because otherwise the gyroscope in your lens, the image stabilizer, might be moving in the wrong direction and it will degrade image quality rather than enhance it. Well, I think that is all that we have time for today. Thank you for your wonderful questions. Yeah. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all again on the next episode of OPG Live. I'm hoping that by our next episode we will have figured out some of the technical difficulties and we'll be able to add some photographs to this presentation so that we can show you uh, better what I'm talking about. We can illustrate it with actual photographs. But until then, I'm Ian Plant. And I'm Lilia Khalif. And thank you for joining us. I definitely get it. <laughs> I hate All waiting right. for it to go not live. A lot of repeat questions coming in today. Yeah. This makes me nervous because the light's still blinking at us. It's a recording. I'm afraid. <laughs>